he has achieved success, has lived well, laughed often, and loved much, has gained the respect of intelligent men and the love of little children, has filled his niche and is accomplishing his task. He will leave the world better than he found it, whether it be by humorous words or a heartfelt song. He has never lacked appreciation of earth's beauty or failed to express it. He has always looked for the best in others and given the best of his life. He is an inspiration and his memory will be a benediction. This man I present to you, Mr. Art Linkletter. Thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted to meet all my friends again, and I number you as my friends because in the last 37 years, you haven't escaped me unless you've been living in a cave. <laughs> 25 years of doing the house party, five days a week, coast to coast on CBS radio and television, 52 weeks a year, has probably allowed me to spend more time with many of you wives than you've spent with your own husbands, <laughs> at least while you were listening. And 19 years of doing People Are Funny every Friday night on NBC radio and then television, 52 weeks a year, has proved to me that most people are good sports about volunteering to do anything in the world since in those 19 years I have sent people on wild goose chases all over the world. I have stolen houses while people were away for a weekend. I have done all the kinds of tricks that people can devise that do prove that people are funny. And of course, I perhaps am best known to at least many of you younger people in the recent years for having as my special guests little children from five to 10 and asking them simple little questions about their family, which has resulted in more families moving away and relocating. <laughs> You know, a little five-year-old around your house for six or eight months and then coming on my show coast to coast and telling everything he's seen is like a bombshell because these little ones don't even know what they're saying. They just say it right out. Bloop. One little boy, I said to him, how did your mother and father meet and fall in love? He said, search me. All they ever told me was they were roommates in college. <laughs> Mother came back after the program to explain that they went to the room, the English room and the history room, and the rest of the kid put it together. Another little boy, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, a bachelor like my father. <laughs> Mother came up after the program to explain his father had just graduated from UCLA with a bachelor's degree. Another little boy came up, I said, uh, what does your father do? He says, he steals. I said, no, for a living. He says, he goes out in the morning at nine, has his lunch with him, and steals all day and comes back. And the mother came back after the show, and she was so furious, she could have bitten my head off. She says, you shouldn't tell children to say things like that just to get a laugh. We had all of our relatives listening in. And I said, well, I don't tell the kids what to say. He heard it somewhere. And she says, oh, no, my husband has a good job, and he couldn't have heard it. And about a week later, I got a letter from them apologizing for her anger because... This is what the kids hear. The father had a job before he came on the show with me several weeks before that he hated. And during the two weeks just before the boy came on my program, the father got a new job that he loved. He'd hated the boss, he'd hated the job, he'd hated the work, and now he loved the work. And he would come home every other day or so, and the wife would say, well, how are things going, dear? And she, he says, oh, wonderful. It's just like having a license to steal. kid heard it and reported it. <laughs> Once in a while, of course, the kids told stories that I don't know what happened to the father afterwards. Like the little boy who came on, he says, my father's a cop and he arrests burglars and cops and thieves and carries a big gun. I said, well, isn't your mother worried about a job like that? And he said, oh, no, she thinks it's a wonderful job. Almost every other week or so, Daddy brings home watches and rings and jewelry. <laughs> and
And then, of course, there are the little three- and four-year-olds who don't know anything. You know, they just say what they think. I have one little boy who says, what do you like to do? He says, I, I collect bugs. I said, how, how do they look? He says, right through their eyes. <laughs> or the kid, I said to him, uh, did your mother tell you anything not to say today? Because the mothers get smart and they brainwash them what not to say. And this little boy said, well, my mother said I can say anything I want to. The main thing she told me is not to get their shirt dirty because it's brand new, it doesn't fit, and we're taking it back the minute I get home. Another little one, four-year-olds. I love the four-year-olds. I said, how do you help your mother? He says, I help her with breakfast. And I said, how do you do that? He says, well, I can put the bread in the toaster. He says, but I can't flush it. It's kind of true, isn't it? <laughs> then the other one, I said, do you get an allowance? And the little boy says, what's that? I says, why, allowance is money that you get every week from your parents if you're a good boy. Oh, he says, yeah, yeah. He says, I get that thing you'd said. And I said, well, what do you get? He says, I get a nickel every day I have a dry bed. <laughs> so I said to him, well, that's marvelous. How much money did you make this summer? He says, nothing. <laughs> and then, of course, there are the kids with pets. Whenever I talk to a little boy or girl who has a pet, I always ask him a, a question that has become like a magic button because it's a word that kids know but they really don't know. They aren't abashed or frightened by the word, but they're not really sure what it is. And that word is pedigree. I said, oh, you have a dog? He says, yes. I said, does it have a pedigree? He says, yes or no. And then I say, how do you know? And a words come out. One little boy says, uh, no, no, our dog doesn't have a pedigree. I says, how do you know? He says, we had it cut off a month ago. <laughs> Or a little girl said, oh, yeah, our kitten has a pedigree. I said, how do you know? She says, he had, she had five of them last year. <laughs> or one that I'll never forget or ever understand. A little boy says, no, our dog doesn't have a pedigree. We're Jewish. <laughs> or the little girl that says, we don't think our dog has a pedigree. We tried it with the dog next door for almost a month. Oh, the kids are marvelous. One little boy, I said, how many brothers and sisters do you have? He says, I have six brothers and nine sisters. I said, how old are they? He says, you start at one and you add one each year till you run out of us. <laughs> and then, of course, some of the kids are pretty modern and they're pretty smart alecky. I had one little boy, I said, you have brothers and sisters? He says, uh, no, he says, I'm single. And I said, well, uh, Oh, I was an only boy. I said, I was an orphan child, and I never had any brothers and sisters. It was kind of lonesome. And he nodded his head, and I said, what would you like to have if you could have your wish? And he thought, and then he says, it wouldn't ruin Mom's shape. He says, I'd like a Shetland pony. <laughs> well, for 25 years, I had fun and laughs with the kids of America generations of them growing up, watching me, being on my program. And so it was only natural that when the youngsters of America began to get into serious trouble with drugs, or with vandalism, or with runaways, or with suicide, or with any of the other things that are bothering the young people and all of us these days, that I would be interested. As a former national member of the YMCA and Boy Scouts and Boys Clubs advisory boards, I have always had a deep and abiding interest in children. I've had five of my own children. I now have six grandchildren. I've had 14 adopted children around the world that Mrs. Linkletter and I have taken care of and visited and brought to our homes from every place in the world in these last 20 years, 25 years, we've had a French orphan and a German, an Italian. We have been to China and we had a, a Chinese girl in Hong Kong, a Greek girl from Athens. 
At the moment, we have two Japanese girls, a Vietnamese boy and a Filipino boy and a Peruvian girl. And I have learned a great many of these languages so I can talk to the children. When I visit my Greek girl, I say, Tikanate, pusiste kala, eparisto. And I meet my Chinese girl, I give a little Mandarin Chinese, which I learned at great pains and great trouble because Mandarin Chinese is very difficult. And then I went to Hong Kong to talk to her. She speaks Cantonese. It's an entirely different Chinese language. I might just as well have learned French. But children I love. Young people I adore. I like to talk to high schools and colleges, and I love to see young people growing up and facing life. And so when my own daughter's life was taken two and a half years ago in a terrible tragedy that resulted in childish, silly, but curious experimentation with LSD, my whole life was changed. All of a sudden, in the face of this terrible tragedy of a young girl of 20 dying just as she had everything in the world before her, she had a contract at Warner Brothers Movies for a television series. She and I had just made a record which won the top Grammy Award of the year for the best talk record of the year. A wonderful, warm record that she and I had made to ask teenagers to not run away from home unless they talked to their parents. It was, it was called, and I'm sure many of you heard it, We Love You, Call Collect. All these things were beckoning her to a beautiful life. But in the middle 60s, young America was experimenting with LSD. They had been told by people like Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor, that it was the greatest gift that God had made to man in the way of chemical trips. And it would give you an insight into your brain that nothing else could do. And that if you dropped acid, if you took LSD, you would see sights and sounds and colors and have experiences which were undreamed of and would make you able to better know who you are. And it was like a religious experience. And so our young people began to try acid. On the other hand, at the other end of the extreme from the Timothy Leary professor were the young acid rock singers and musicians who were not only singing drug songs, but more importantly, living drug lives. The Beatles, great musicians, great performers, and great artists were bragging about turning on with pot, with dropping acid, with trying other things. And many of the other groups, the Rolling Stone, the Jefferson Airplane and many others were bragging openly in time and life in the big newspapers about how they got high. And so the young people of America looking at their idols, rich, famous, popular, traveling all over the world, the idols of America, they were using drugs. Nothing too bad could be said about drugs if that was happening. And so the young people were fooling around and they were trying drugs. And of course, let's not forget it, all of us who are a little older. It wasn't just the kids who were trying drugs in America. Without realizing that this whole country has become the biggest pill-popping, drug-taking population in the history of the world. The average American cabinet at home, medicine cabinet, has uppers and downers, that means Bennies and Dexies and Reds and second owls to go to sleep and to wake up and to tranquilize and to get through the day. The average American, at least 70 million of them, were practically chain smokers. And the kids saw them smoking package after package of cigarette while the Surgeon General of the United States was saying, these are dangerous, these will kill, these will harm your health. They saw their parents and others smoking with that kind of a warning. The kids are not dumbbells. They could see the figures. 30,000 people a year killed. 30,000 human beings killed every year with alcohol-related accidents on the highway. Three quarters of a million accidents a year from alcohol. Eight billion dollars in costs from alcohol. And yet they saw their parents getting smashed every Saturday night or double martinis before dinner every night. They saw all these things. Could we be really so surprised that the kids would have a go at it themselves? 
but of course not. This is a tense age. This is a revolutionary period we're living in when more changes are happening more rapidly than ever before in the history of the world. It's puzzling and bewildering to those of us who are grown up. Think how much more so it is for kids of 14, 15, 16, and 17, worried because they may drop the whole damn bomb, uh, atom bomb, and blow up the world, upset because every time they pick up a paper they read about civil riots and strikes and violence in the street and murders. These are times of great turbulence and times of great worry and change. More heart attacks in the last hundred years than in perhaps the history of mankind because people are dying from heart attacks due to being tense and worried. And so it's an age of worry it's an age when the television and the radio and the newspaper tells you in the biggest, best ads that they can possibly run, don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Don't have any problems at all because there's a little box of pills somewhere with a very interesting name on them, thousands of them, and you just drop that pill and your worries are over for a couple of hours. And so we have just tranquilized ourselves into a state of euphoria which is fake and phony and which has made us less able to face pain, psychological or physiological, than any race of human beings in the history of the world. True. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of amphetamine tablets manufactured in this country every year. Tons of sleeping pills. Tons. Enough for 50 tablets every year for every man, woman, and child in the United States are manufactured every year. Do we really need to zonk ourselves out of life this much? And yet we're all guilty, every one of us. And so about 1960, marijuana became a very hot item in the young world, and it began to be used. Then about 1965 or 66, acid became the big in thing. Then about 1968, amphetamines, the speed, the uppers, the stimulants became the big thing. And then about 1970 was the year of heroin, which we call smack or H or horse or any of the other drug world names. And now this year, in the changing pattern of drug abuse, what is in the big in thing? Downers, barbs, reds, secondals, the sleeping tablets that give you a cheap, easy, long, euphoric, uh, kind of a hangover and you can just kind of dream your way through the day and you can drop a few more of them if you begin to feel painful again and that's what we're facing up to right now and so in the last two and a half years I have talked to the experts I have listened to the kids I have gone into the ghettos and talked with the drug addicts of all kinds from the heavy hard users of narcotics to the kids who are just fooling around with marijuana. And so my mission now, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, is to just tell you some of the things I've learned about this very, very complex subject called drug abuse. Now to begin with, let me tell you that there is no one reason why anybody abuses drugs and there is no one way they're going to stop. People basically use drugs to avoid any kind of pain. Or they use them, as young kids do, because they're curious. They hear about it, they read about it, they know about it, they've got to try it. All kids growing up try all kinds of things. They walk across pipes over uh, ravines that they shouldn't because it's a risk. When they're younger, they climb trees that they shouldn't. I've heard mothers yell at their kids out at the backyard, if you fall out of that tree and break your arm, I'm going to kill you. Kids are curious. Kids are thrill-seeking. And if they hear about something, boy, they want to try it. And so those are more reasons. As they grow a little older, some kids try drugs because they're rebellious. They're mad. Their parents don't really understand them. Their teacher hates them. Their girlfriend has dumped them. They haven't made the basketball team. Their grades are lousy. 
and the whole world's no damn good, so why not try something? That's a good reason, they think. Or they try it simply because they are lonesome and they're bored. Some kids, and I could tell you the names of movie star kids that would knock you right out of your seat who are hooked on drugs because they're bored stiff. Since they were little kids, they've had speedboats, motor cars, uh, motorbikes, trips around the world, money, everything they want. They're bored. They're looking for the next big thrill. What's the kick around the corner? And so they've gotten hooked into drugs. There are many, many reasons for becoming a drug addict. I talked to a little black boy in the ghetto of New York. I was shooting a film there with Nicky Cruz. Some of you may have heard of Nicky. Nicky Cruz was a Puerto Rican whose father was a witch doctor and who had 17 brothers and four sisters and he was thrown out of the house and sent to New York to live with a brother and he was kicked out there and he became the head of the toughest gang in the city of New York, the Mau Mau's. 174 guys and 60 girls, terrorists, young hoodlums who carried bicycle chains and zip guns and switchblades and they used to go out and hijack a complete subway, get on it, put a knife to the motorman's throat and go back and rob the people in the cars and take it out to Coney Island and get off and terrorize the whole fun zone of Coney Island. They used to have gang fights with the other gangs of New York City that were just like pitched battles in World War II. And he was saved and converted to Christianity by Billy Wilkerson, who wrote The Cross and the Switchblade who went down into the slums of New York and confronted this gang and they spit in his face and they kicked him in the groin and they stepped on his feet and they told him they were going to kill him and he just kept saying, Jesus loves you. I love you. You can kill me. You can cut me up. You can beat me to death. You can break my bones. But I love you and Jesus loves you. You're human beings and you should not be throwing your lives away in this kind of life. And he converted these kids. And Nicky Cruz has now become a minister and is going around saving young people. This tough, rough kid. And I was in Brooklyn with him photographing his life. And we went down and incidentally got some of his old gang members together, 10 years now. Gangs are all broken up. No more gangs in New York. You know why? Those kind of kids are on drugs. You can't have a gang if you're on drugs. If you're on drugs, you have no discipline. You can't be on time, you can't be organized, you can't have a plan because the people who are supposed to be there are passed out or they're out looking for another fix or something. And so the drug business has killed the gang business. But anyway, we were there photographing this. And this little black boy came up to me and there up and down his arm were needle tracks. Needle tracks is the drug talk for hypodermic needle marks where repeatedly he has taken this needle, sucked up a little blood from his vein, and then shot the white heroin into his body, which gives him what they call the nod, which means that he just goes into a kind of a dreamy sleep for a few hours. Then he wakes up and he's got to have more drugs right away. So I said to this little 14-year-old boy, I said, boy, you really started early, didn't you? He says, I've been a junkie for two years. I said, you started when you were how old? He says, 12. Well, I said, you know, that as long as you're a junkie, you can never be anything else because all you can do is spend the rest of your life trying to get more heroin. He says, I don't care. He says, I'm a junkie, and I was never anything before I was a junkie. And this is an important thing that I'm telling you because there are children, as well as grown-ups in this world, who don't belong to anything. Nobody loves them. Nobody cares for them. They have no future. They have no education. So the one thing they can become is a junkie. And then they belong to something. His mother was a prostitute. His father was in jail. His brother was a pusher. He was out of school. No future. No hope. So he became a junkie. And proud of it, even though it was eventually going to kill him and he knew it. He'd rather be part of something for a few years than nothing for the rest of his life. So you see, there are many reasons why people turn to drugs. And I want to tell you that in these last 12 or 14 years, the rise in the experimental use of drugs in this country 
now takes in about 75 to 80 percent of all of our kids. I'm talking about your kids, not somebody else's kids. Today, across this country, 75 to 80 percent of all kids are going to try something once or twice. Thank God, most of them are not going to go on because they don't need it, because it's just something to try, and they go on in their own life, which is good enough for them. But of the 75 or 80 percent who do try, about 20 or 25 percent will become what we call recreational users of the drugs, weekenders, occasional users. These are people who won't really go searching for drugs, and they won't try them every day, but if they're at a party and the drugs are there, they'll try them. Now, you know drinkers the same way, don't you? People who don't drink at home necessarily, they don't have a bottle of booze in the car, but if they go to a place where everybody's drinking, okay, they'll have a belt. Same way with these kids and drugs. They'll smoke a little pot every week or two when they go to a party. This is about 20 to 25%. About 10% of that 75% will become what we call heads. They will find that marijuana or the uppers or the downers or the LSD is such a pleasant experience in a life which is not too pleasant for them that they want it every couple of days or every other day. When this happens, that 10% become what we call heads. A pot head a reefer head, a marijuana head, is somebody who uses it every day or every other day. He's kind of perpetually in a kind of a little uh, state of uh, marijuana drunkenness, or barbiturates, or amphetamines, which are the uppers of the downers, or the LSD. Then of this 10%, about 3 or 4% go on to the next big jump, and this is a big one. This is the injection of drugs into their veins, not swallowing it, not sniffing it, not skin popping it right under the surface, but into the vein. And that 3 or 4% become a hardcore of narcotics users who are almost unable to ever kick the habit. You know what percentage of heroin users ever get permanently well right now? About one half of one percent. That's about all. We know of cases where people have kicked the narcotic habit for as long as ten years and even worked helping other drug users to get off drugs, but eventually they go back. And they go back because, ladies and gentlemen, it's not the physical addiction that counts. You can kick that and get it out of your system. It's here, up in the bean, because every heroin and every hard drug user knows that there is a cave, a chemical cave into which he can crawl away from the pain, away from the hurt, away from the defeats, away from the loneliness of life. And someday, down the line, just like an Alcoholics Anonymous, there comes a time when his wife dies or leaves him, when a child is killed, when a severe blow to his pride, like losing a job or being made a fool of, hits him, and way back there, he thinks, I know a place where nothing can touch me, and he's back into the drugs. This is the problem with that last jump, the needle freaking. So those are the parameters of the subject. And I want to tell you that while we've had drugs all through the history of mankind, we have never had drugs as they are today. With the best people, the best families, being cursed by the use of drugs. We've always had drugs for the no-hopers, the ones down in the gutter who have no way to look. But now what's happening? High schools and colleges where kids have the whole world ahead of them, like my daughter did. They got everything to hope for. And they look for a thrill, or they get very rebellious and say, to hell with this lousy world. I'm going to shoot up or do something. And these are the ones that are going down the drain today. And there's nobody in this auditorium who has a child that does not have to think of the possibility that this will be on your doorstep tomorrow because kids can get drugs everywhere, quite often from your own medicine cabinet. I had a letter just a month ago from a woman who said, Dear Mr. Linkletter, I'm very worried about my teenage daughter. I think she's on sleeping pills. The reason I think so is that so many of mine have been missing in the last six months. Sad? 
She didn't even realize the irony of it. And yet, today, regardless of who you are, how important you are, how rich you are, how religious or how educated you are, your kid might be getting into drugs. What are you going to do about it? Well, here's what you're going to do about it if you're a parent. First, you're going to spend a couple of hours learning about it, not just for me, but writing for some little booklet. There's so many places today that you can get wonderful, modern, up-to-date material that you couldn't have gotten two years ago. What a change has come in this country in just two years. Today, you can write to the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, D.C. They'll send you a free booklet. You can write to the Red Cross in Washington. You can write to the Blue Shield in Chicago. You can write to the Boy Scouts or the YMCA. You get modern, up-to-date material that'll tell you what to look for, what the drugs are, what they do, and some of the suggestions of what you can do about it. And any parent in this country who doesn't take the trouble to at least spend an hour reading what drugs are about is a damn fool and an irresponsible parent and is risking his child's life. The least you can do is to find out what's going on. Most of you don't know. Most of you, what you do know is wrong because there's more misinformation about drugs, more junk been put out up until now than any other subject I can think about. And I was as guilty as every one of you. I thought marijuana was a narcotic and an addictive drug. Of course it's not. It's a lot of other things, but it wasn't that. I had all kinds of the same fantasies you did. I thought if my kid had a marijuana cigarette in him, he was gone. He was going to be a thief, he was going to be a drug addict, he was going to be a lot of things, which is not true. Any more than when you and I were kids and we stole a nip out of Dad's bourbon bottle. We weren't goners. And that's all that many kids are doing today. So the first thing every parent could do is to learn what the drug subject is and some of the language. Second, have a talk with your kid. I don't mean call him in and say, have you been using marijuana, you rascal? That's not talking to him. That's trying him. Call your kid in and say, what do you hear about this business? I'm reading about all the kids taking drugs. I'm curious to know, what do you think about it? Would you take it? Has anybody offered it to you? Have you ever tried it? And then if your kid says, well, yes, Dad, I did try it, you don't hit him right in the nose. And you don't tell him he's a bum, and you don't tell him he's lost. You say, well, what was it like? Where did you get it? What happened? Do you want to do it again? And if he says, well, it wasn't bad. I'd kind of like to try it again maybe sometime, honestly. Sit down with him and say, well, why do you need it? Do you need it? Is there something wrong with your life? Is life so dull and hopeless for you that you're going to risk your future? Because if it's that dull, we ought to do something about it. Maybe you aren't getting enough time and attention from your mother and me. Maybe you should have some kind of a job or some kind of a trip or something to work for so that life is interesting because drugs can only make it more painful in the long run. And if you have to take drugs, something must be wrong. You're missing something. Anyhow, you should be able to talk to them. Now, mind you, if you haven't done your homework first and you don't know anything about drugs, the chances are he'll know more about it than you. And when you make some kind of a stupid statement, he'll just mentally go, <coughs> and you're off. The door is shut, you're gone. He's standing there, you're standing there, but you might as well be in separate rooms because he has found out you're a jerk. You haven't done your homework. And of course, if he has used drugs, just as you shouldn't overreact and become emotional and panic-filled, you shouldn't underreact and do what some parents do, some idiotic parents. I can't understand how they'd ever do it. But there are some fools among parents who are so busy trying to establish communications with their own kids that they'll say, well, let's sit down and smoke it together. And lots of parents do this. Knowing it's against the law, knowing that it could lead to many other things, and condoning something which doesn't need to be done in the first place any more than you'd say, well, let's get drunk together. But you shouldn't overreact either way. And of course, there's one little thing that I mentioned at the start of my talk that you should perhaps do before you read about it or talk about it. And that's to go in and take a look at the mirror. Because if the face that you see looking at you out of the mirror is one that is accustomed to using any kind of drugs heavily, if you are a coffee-holic, if you have to have eight cups of coffee in the morning or you shake, if you can't 
get through the day without two or three packs of cigarettes, or if you drink a lot, or you take uppers or downers, forget it. Forget all the rest of the stuff I told you, because it's a waste of time. You can't tell kids not to do something that you're already doing, and they know it. Kids do what you do, not what you say they should do. And if you're a youngster, and you're not a parent, I can tell you something, and that is that there's only one way in the world to become grown up, mature, able to face life, and that's to stand some pain. You're not going to have a bowl of cherries all your life. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get your nose rubbed in it. You're going to be unhappy. And the only way you can ever grow up and face those kind of problems is to face them. Because every time you run away with drugs of any kind, alcohol or booze or anything, you're eliminating the muscles of what we call a defense mechanism against life, and you're not going to be able to do it the next time either. When I talk to kids, boys especially in high school, I say to them, how do you suppose an athlete ever becomes a champion? He certainly doesn't do it without aching muscles, defeats, bruises, sweating, fatigue, pain, and all the other things. And then he becomes a great athlete. Well, the only way a person ever becomes a great person is to face pain without running away from it, to face defeat without taking something. And so I would say to our kids, grow up. Take your knocks along with the good things because that's the way you enjoy the good things and that's the way you build up defenses against the bad things. Furthermore, I would say that it's stupid. You know the great game of chicken that kids play? They say, come on, try this, Joe, or you're a chicken. There's a defense to that that every kid can use. Most kids don't want to be chicken and they get a little feeble and they say, oh, well, uh, I know I, I, I know I shouldn't use that. My mother told me not to use it. My father told me I shouldn't be swallowing things. And they say, ah, you're chicken. And the kid is defensive. The greatest answer to anybody who is offering you drugs is not to be defensive as to why you're not taking, but to be offensive and say, you are a jerk. You are stupid. And anybody who is using that kind of stuff is stupid because the odds are bad. It's Russian roulette with the odds stacked against you. So why get involved with it? Say, get lost, you jerk. Then he's on the defensive, not you. And I've seen this work time and time again. But kids have to stand up for what they believe in, and what they believe in is what they see and learn at home. The church can only do so much. The school can only do so much. It's at home that we must fight not just drug abuse, but vandalism, destruction, runaways, suicide, all the things that are rising and rising and rising in our younger population. And it's got to be done right where it starts at home. And what's going on in the American home today? Well, pretty sad. About one out of every three marriages in the country is breaking up to begin with on an average and two out of every four in Hollywood. And when a home breaks up, something serious happens. The average young person of 10 or 11 or 12 when he loses either a mother or a dad in divorce is something of an emotional shock, as the doctors tell me, like amputation of a leg or an arm. It's a tremendous loss. And the kid is tempted to go try things during those times that he wouldn't try otherwise. And do you know something else? One out of every four families in the United States moves every year to some other neighborhood, which means a whole new set of friends, a whole new set of surroundings. And so the kid is constantly being thrust into new environments with chances and potentials for all kinds of problems. So the American home is weakening from this standpoint. And then, of course, there's the old business of dad being a sucker and dad being a jerk that's been portrayed in most of our television shows and comic strips until dad today in America is kind of a jerk in many places instead of being the boss of the family. Uh, you know, I still think that the dads are the most important single thing for the average kid growing up because he's the strength of the family. And I know from talking to the experts an interesting fact. Almost every hard user of narcotics 
who is in these halfway houses and Phoenix houses and Synanons and in the hospitals have one characteristic along with a lot of others. They almost all have either a poor father or no father. The father figure is very important in the drug scene. And so I think these are things that are happening in our American family, plus the fact that the average kid today gets so much so soon and so easily that he's looking for a thrill faster than any set of young people in the history of the world. I'm going to talk for a minute about the hardest subject to talk to young people about, marijuana. I want to take a minute because this is a subject most parents have to, f have to kind of fumble around about, and I want to present both sides. To begin with, in the 1930s, the narcotics officers of the country mistakenly put out the word that marijuana was a narcotic and it was addictive, and those are misstatements of fact. But now the kids have gone so far the other way, they say marijuana is nothing. And that's not true either. There is plenty that we do know for sure about marijuana that indicates it has some very great dangers. Take history. If we don't learn from history, we don't learn from anything. In the history of the world, marijuana has been smoked, drunk, eaten, sniffed, and injected all over the world. In the world today, there is only one nation that legalizes marijuana and hashish. And hashish is marijuana, but it's the rosin of the marijuana. In Egypt, the possession of hashish has a serious penalty, death. And in many other countries of the world, marijuana is considered dangerous. And they've had it for thousands of years. We are signatories, the United States, to a world pact that we will put down marijuana and all the nations of the world have signed it. So talking about legalizing in this country is nonsense. We aren't going to defy the whole world just for one thing, just for openers. The second thing is that marijuana is a word that is used very loosely as if it were one thing, a loaf of bread or an apple or a peach. Marijuana is a lot of things. To begin with, the marijuana grown in the United States is so weak and so diminished in its percentage of THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, and that is the hallucinogenic agent in the leaves. It's so weak that the average person in this house today could smoke a joint of American-grown marijuana, and when you finish smoking it, you'd say, what's, what's the fuss about? I don't feel anything. What, what, what happens? I thought something was going to happen. You wouldn't feel anything because it has so little. And number two, you don't know how to smoke it. You have to learn how to hold it in your lungs. You have to kind of have a mental picture of what's going to happen and just kind of be ooshed into it. Now that's our American marijuana, but now you take marijuana grown in uh, Acapulco. That's not the same baby at all. It has the same name. It's called Acapulco Gold. It has about four to five times more THC in it than ours does. Now you take marijuana, same plant, grown under the same conditions, you get it from Cambodia or Taos or, uh, or Thailand or, or Laos or Cambodia. Now you've got stuff beginning to approach LSD in its hallucinogenic properties. So you see where it comes from, how it's grown, how it's harvested, how it's cured is all something different. Now, what part of the plant are you talking about? Are you talking about the leaves? They're all right. You talk about the, the rosin, five to eight times as strong as the leaves. Now let's talk about the kind of person who's smoking it. Are you a mature, emotionally sound, stable person smoking marijuana in your home, an older person, settled in life? Chances are nothing much will happen. Are you a kind of a frightened kid in a back alley or in a garage or in an attic? Maybe the fuzz is waiting outside to bust you. Maybe it's some kids are saying, hey, man, get a drag of this, and you're all upset and uptight and excited. That's a different kind of a reaction. Maybe you're one of these many, many, many people who have a little emotional imbalance built into you. Do you know that in this country today, more than half 
of all the hospital beds in the United States are filled with mental cases? The greatest single user of hospital space are mental cases. We have a lot of people who aren't all that great wandering around. And these kind of people, and all of us could be partly that way, these kind of people are directly psychotically affected by marijuana. Now you take the kid who has got three or four or five joints of hot marijuana and he's got an automobile. He goes out and gets in that car and he's not inebriated because marijuana doesn't make you roll and lurch and fall over, but he could be as high as somebody else with four drinks. He's got muscular coordination, he can walk out, he gets in the car, but he is high. He is seeing distance, time, and space all twisted. He has not the reaction in his eyes to face oncoming lights. He does not have judgment. And he's getting in a car, going out on the road, and he's a greater menace than anybody who's drunk. So all these things add up to the fact that marijuana has some dangers. And we shouldn't just go running down the path and saying that because 10 or 15 million people may be trying it, we should have marijuana legalized. Don't forget, we cannot compare it to prohibition and alcohol because there were over 90 million trying alcohol and using it socially before prohibition was proved ineffective because there were so many people. There aren't that many people using marijuana to use the same arguments that prohibition didn't work and neither will the laws against marijuana. So, one more thing. One of my good friends is Dr. Harvey Powelson, chief of the psychiatric department of the University of California. Great scientist, a solid citizen. Dr. Powelson was asked five years ago by the Berkeley newspaper, what do you think of marijuana? There's a big argument about it. He answered offhand, I think marijuana is a mildly intoxicating plant, non-addictive, probably wouldn't hurt anybody. This came out in the headlines of the paper. Dr. Powelson, chief psychiatrist, says pot is okay. He told me that many of his colleagues in the free speech movement in Berkeley and so forth came around and put our arms around him and said, you're okay, buddy. You're all right. And a lot of the graduate students who were smoking pot came around to shake his hand and congratulate him. Kind of worried him because he didn't know that much about marijuana. He just made an offhand statement about one of 50 different things he's asked. Made big headlines. So he began to study it. Listen carefully. Five years passed. He has two to 3,000 cases a year of young people come through his department. He analyzed and watched case after case of regular users of marijuana. I'm not talking about the occasional. I'm talking about regular heads. Three months or four months ago, he then gave the second interview out to the paper. And this is what the headlines now read. Pot smokers can't think straight. Dr. Harvey Powelson says that in case after case, regular marijuana users do not have the ability to think straight. They will be studying or working and apparently everything is going fine and all of a sudden they can't remember the things they should remember or they can't judge what is the priority of important things to do. They don't have the judgment as to say, this is the big thing we should do, and then this, and then this. They just take anything at random. And he cited cases of brilliant young students who had gone right down the drain as regular heads using strong marijuana. So with do doctors like that, and I could give you case after case of this happening, we cannot just say marijuana is nothing. Because if marijuana is anything, the very least it is, is a pleasant way to get high with your friends. Feel bold, feel like a champion, and if you're with friends who smoke marijuana, one of them, sooner or later, is going to have something else. And when you're feeling this good, and you're a youngster, one of your friends is going to say, hey, if you think that's good, you ought to try a tab of this, or try a couple of these rainbows. And you wouldn't ordinarily take it, and you don't need it and the marijuana hasn't induced you to try it, but the friends have. And sooner or later, high on marijuana, with a drug crowd, you're going to try something else, and that goes right down the line, because you try something and you like it, 
and you try more of it and over and over the cases come that the missionaries of the drug world are the kids themselves sold on drugs and selling their friends just like my friends at cocktail parties say come on art have a belt the sun is over the yard arm let's start the party and I say to them some of them distinguished businessmen and politicians and professional leaders just for the fun of it I say to them Fred you know what you are he says what, what do you mean what am I I said you're a pusher he says well, a pusher I said yeah you just offered me alcohol that's a drug and anybody who offers anybody a drug is a pusher so I merely tell this story to illustrate that your kids aren't going to be approached in the playground alley by some sinister gangster some terrible mafia figure who's trying to suck your kid into the drug field that isn't the way it's going to happen it's going to happen with some good buddy of his saying hey I tried something and it's great I'll give it to you free come on in and let's have some fun that's what happens those are the real pushers they're your kids and my kids who are the pushers the tough guys up on top the furnishers the wholesalers the suppliers they're not the ones down in the firing line because they wouldn't be caught with the stuff. They're too smart. But that's how your kids get into it. And I hope and pray that nothing like that ever happens to your kid. But if it does, remember what I told you. Don't overreact. Don't panic. Sit down and make up for some of the lost time as a buddy that's willing to admit that you too have made your mistakes. He's going to make some and you two are going to work it out together so it doesn't get serious. Now what happens if unfortunately God forbid one of your kids really gets into the heavy stuff really gets using meth speed and one of these other things what should you do well I can tell you parents this this is no place for amateurs this is no place for loving tender home hands your kid is in trouble and he needs professional help you need help in a hurry if your kid is really into the drug scene where do you go maybe you're lucky enough to have a family doctor who's done some homework on this subject and can help maybe the doctor knows somebody if he doesn't who really understands the drug scene and can help your youngster maybe it's a psychological thing that you should go to your family minister and if he isn't the one maybe your family psychologist or psychiatrist if there is one or maybe a coach or a probation officer or someone who understands who can communicate with this boy because he's in trouble and if my child were really hooked on something which thank God doesn't happen too often especially in a medium-sized town like this I would think nothing at all of committing him if I had to to a hospital or someplace not a jail but to a hospital or to a halfway house or to some kind of psychiatric and professional help because your child is in danger of losing his life in a hurry many different ways overdose infection and other ways but if you do this remember that your child is still not lost he can still be saved and speaking of being saved I want to tell you the most helpful most encouraging sign that I've seen in the last 10 years across this country today is among our young people growing a feeling of religious fervor and a religion of Christianity and an acceptance of Christ that I have never seen before last week in Washington I was talking to Billy Graham about this and Billy Graham is a great guy and he and I compared notes on it and we both agree that we see in high schools and colleges and across the country teen challenge campus for Christ crusade for Christ we see on the charts of the hot records we don't see a little help for your friends and the yellow submarine and tambourine man all the drug songs we see Jesus Christ superstar the man from Galilee and other religious songs up in the top 10 or 15 now you may not agree that Jesus Christ superstar is the greatest religious message in the world and you may think it's profane but you've got to admit it's a lot better even if it's far out even if it's a little weird it's a lot better than drugs it's a lot better than sex it's a lot better than suicide and that's what's happening 
The young people are turning to Christianity. Many of them not in churches. They're called Jesus freaks. They're called street Christians. They're doing weird, far out things. They're baptizing each other in rain puddles and barrels of water in the surf. And they're parading up and down and they're throwing themselves down on the ground. And they're doing a lot of extreme things because a lot of them are pretty far out. But better than drugs. Better than lying dead from an overdose in some alley. That's one of the things that's happening. The music has gone by. We're getting better music. Across the country, as I said, there's lots of good material, lots of good movies about drugs being shown. Organizations like Aid to Lutherans, Boy Scouts, Kiwanis, Elks, are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with programs designed to educate and help. Across the country, the school systems are beginning to put on real drug programs, not scary drug programs. Nobody ever got scared out of using drugs, but sensible drug programs. And you know where they're starting now? First grade. A first grade. What can you teach a first grader about drugs? Well, let me tell you. About a month or two, two or three months ago, I had an exciting week. It started on a Monday when I appeared before the United Nations in New York. What a thrill it is, even for a speaker like myself who's appeared all over the world to be on the stage in front of the United Nations introduced by Secretary General Uthant. Being translated into 35 languages, the ambassadors of the world, and I spoke on the international narcotics problem, the trail of the opiate from Turkey to Lebanon to Syria to Marseille to the United States. I told how traffickers in human misery can buy a brick of opium in Turkey, a kilo, 2.2 tenths pounds for five or ten dollars. They can smuggle this into Syria where it's made into morphine, smuggle it to Marseille where it's made into heroin, smuggle it into the United States where that same ten dollar brick of opium, cut 20 times, 25 times, is sold on the streets of New York City for how much money? Two hundred thousand dollars from ten dollars because the average shot of heroin in the streets of New York today is about three to four percent heroin. The rest of that white powder is junk to fill it up and give it bulk. That's what's happening. And I spoke about this to the United Nations. Afterwards, they gave a dinner in my honor. One of the ambassadors to, from Saudi Arabia came up to me at the dinner and he says, Mr. Linkletter, he says, we have an old fashioned device we use in Saudi Arabia to discourage the kind of thing you were talking about. I said, what's that? He said, beheading. <laughs> well, I left the United Nations and went to a little town called Appleton, Wisconsin. And there I made about six or seven talks for the aid to Lutherans. And I was going to so many places talking, I wasn't really, I must confess, very observant about where I was going to go next. I'm so used to talking about this subject, whatever group I'm talking to, I fit it to whatever happens. So we drove up to this big school, and I thought it was a high school or a junior high school, and I got out and went backstage. And they said, there's a television camera out there, we're going to be on the air live for one hour with this talk. And I said, oh, fine. And I looked out through the curtains. Boy, I almost did a flip. On mats, it was a gym on mats all over this great big floor were 900 first graders. Have you ever looked into a gigantic bucket of worms? <laughs> there they were, picking and scratching and spitting and wetting and giggling. And I thought, oh God, how am I going to talk to this bunch about drugs? Well, I went out, rearranged my vocabulary and figures of speech and what I could tell them so I wouldn't frighten them and I wouldn't scare them, but I'd talk about drugs the same way I would have talked to them about matches. Matches create fire. Fire cooks our food, heats our houses, gives us light. Wonderful but it burns down our houses, and it kills our forests, and it can be a dreadful thing if it's not controlled. And then I said the same thing is true of drugs. Drugs help the sick. They cure those who are in deep trouble, but they hurt people who are healthy and take them, and so on. 
Well, what a rewarding experience. I had letters from those kids for the next three months. And they're scrawly, big block letters. You know how kids... And, and of course, I know the kids didn't write me because they wanted to. I know kids. The teacher says, children, before we go to recess, <laughs> you're going to write that nice Mr. Link letter. So I got these big block letters like parents get from camp. First one from a little girl. Dear Art Linkletter, thank you for coming to our school and leading us into drug abuse. <laughs> then I get a letter from a boy. Dear Mr. Linkletter, you are the best speaker I have ever heard. Period paragraph. You are the only speaker I have ever heard. <laughs> Kids from the first grade up can be taught about drugs as a double-edged weapon that are good if they're used properly and bad if they're used wrongly. And I'll give you an example of a wonderful new educational gimmick being used in the drug field with first graders. This is a film made at the Loma Linda University, which is a medical university in Southern California. They took glass cages with uh, little sticks in them and they put spiders in there. And then they took big high-powered cameras and they zeroed in on these simple little spiders. Now, you may not know this, but every species of spider has its own kind of web. They're beautiful geometrical designs and they're always made by each species exactly the same way that the other ones make it. Because when these spiders are born, the genetic information is put into their little simple computer brains that says, build a web, something will fly into it, eat it. So you see in this film these gorgeous spider webs. And you know, if you've never watched a spider make a web, it's a terrific thing to see this little thing going. And every one of those little squares is just built beautifully. Now the next thing they do after the kids have seen this, they see a man with a machine come along and blow marijuana smoke from a heavily concentrated marijuana s cigarette into the glass cage. They've removed the webs. Now the spider, boy, he's feeling no pain. This spider is high as a pothead can be. And he sets out to build his web. Oh, holy smoke, what a web. Every direction. This guy doesn't know any more about building a web than I do. The strands go this way and they go that way. And uh, a fly could fly through them like a gym. And the little kids see this, and the teacher says, now, if marijuana smoke can take a simple little creature who has been programmed by centuries of genetic hereditary bringing up to build this web, what do you think it's going to do to complicated human beings with brains and all kinds of, of, of emotional values and different decisions? We're not here just to do one little thing. We've got to do a lot of things. Well, now, that's an example of how drugs can be explained to a kid without saying they're terrible, they're frightening, they're going to ruin you. They just show this sort of a thing. Because you see a television commercial that goes on the air for 30 seconds showing somebody dying of a hypodermic syringe in the back alley of a ghetto doesn't do much good. Because the kids who are really into drugs say, ah, that can't happen to me, that'll never happen to me, I don't care. And the kids who aren't into drugs look at such a horrible sight with absolutely no connection. They're like kids who would be stealing money from their mother's purses now and then, being shown a film of bank robbers being lined up on a wall and shot. They don't have any relation to that. They're just stealing a couple of nickels once in a while. And so those kind of things really aren't the greatest. What drug education needs is an interesting, believable, dramatic exposition of the fact that drugs are a bum trip. They're stupid. They're bad news. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you a little look at a complex, difficult problem to envision. No one reason for kids taking drugs. No one reason for them getting off. 
Anytime anybody comes up to me and says, hey, I got a way to stop the drug problem, I just wash him right out because there is no way. All ways are good in some ways. Drugs like methadone are good in some ways, bad in some ways. Religion is the finest single answer I know, but it can only happen when a person is ready for religion. Education is great, but it doesn't help everybody. The Synanon game that they play in these halfway houses and Phoenix houses is good for some and bad for others. I would say that knowledge plus love plus communication plus the trust in God is the greatest single combination of answers that we could possibly come by. I would say that drugs are not our problem. People are our problem. We're never going to pass laws strong enough we're never going to build jails big enough. We're never going to hire enough policemen. We're never going to hire enough immigration officers to stop the flow of drugs. In the beginning, there were 300,000 plants, species, growing in the world, all over the world. Of those 300,000 plants, 64 happen to be drug plants that make you see all kinds of colored visions. There's our old friend, Cannabis sativa, which is marijuana. Our old friend, the poppy, from which come the opiates, morphine, opium, heroin, codeine, etc. There are our old friends from the 4,000 to 6,000 foot level in the Andes Mountains in South America. Cocaine. Cocaine from the cocoa leaf. Bright, iridescent, shiny powder when sniffed up the nose gives expressions of delight and ecstasy that enslave a person for the rest of his life. There's our old friends, the mushrooms, the magic mushrooms of Mexico that are filled with, halluc filled with hallucinogenic things. They're the little buttons on the cactus plant, which come the opiates, morphine, opium, heroin, codeine, etc. There are our old friends from the 4,000 to 6,000 foot level in the Andes Mountains in South America. Cocaine. Cocaine from the cocoa leaf. Bright, iridescent, shiny powder. When sniffed up the nose, gives expressions of delight and ecstasy that enslave a person for the rest of his life. There's our old friends, the mushrooms. The magic mushrooms of Mexico that are filled with, halluc filled with hallucinogenic things. They're the little buttons on the cactus plant called peyote, which are used by Indians in many parts of this country as their religious experience, from which comes mescaline, now synthesized. There are many kinds of seeds and berries and roots and leaves, 64 of them. That was in the beginning. Today, out of our magical, miraculous chemical laboratories, come some 5,000 other drugs synth synthesized from alkaloids, the LSD, the STP, the DMT, and many, many others. And we're never going to stop that flood. We are never going to lick drug abuse by trying to keep it from getting two people. We've got to try, but we're never going to beat it. We've got to beat drug abuse by putting things inside people so they don't need the drugs. I'm talking about love and care and communication, some time with the kids where we really give. The average parent today doesn't spend much real time with his kids. He gives them a car and a suit and a trip to the camp and he gives them a, a, a cassette player and he gives them records. He just doesn't bother to give them himself. Along about a month before Christmas, I was in New York City and I was riding with a cab driver. And you know how cabbies like to talk? This one says, I got one more hour, Mr. Linkletter. It's three o'clock. At four o'clock, I dump this cab. I've been in it since eight o'clock this morning. And I go around the corner to the other place and I get into another cab and I work there from five to one. I said, God, why are you beating yourself up like this? He says, I got two kids, one of them 12, the other one 14, and those kids are going to have everything. And I almost said to him, everything but what? But you, what do they need and want more than anything else, whether they know it or not? 
It's him, not an extra cassette player or an extra TV set. And in one way or another, too many parents in this country are doing that. They're working their tails off, or they're out doing good, or they're doing something, and they're not with their kids. Enough. Another thing, of course, is TV. Marvelous, just like drugs. It's being abused. How many homes do you know of where night after night the whole family's together, and this is the total conversation in four hours? Junior, get your dad a bottle of beer during this commercial. That's all that's said the whole evening. Nobody talks to anybody. They're watching Bonanza and I Love Lucy and All in the Family and occasionally me. <laughs> People aren't talking. It's old, nothing new about it, but my God, how important it is that we value our children. They're the most wonderful things in the world and we take them for granted and we don't spend much of ourselves with them. All these things are the only finally an final answer the drug abuse and all the related things that are happening across this country. I just hope that in this marvelous audience of attentive listeners and head nodders that you won't all be head nodders. I realize that most of you feel that this is not really going to be your trouble because it can't happen to your kid. And I realize that even those of you who think it might happen will go out of this place tonight and you'll go home and you have a hundred other problems. The rent, the doctor bills, the Joe has broken his leg next door, we're going on a trip someplace next week, all these plans, and my talk will kind of be remembered as a nice thing, but fade out. Most of us are just too busy to get involved till we're hurt. A few of you here may rededicate yourself to something that'll help, either seeing that your educational system in this town does something, seeing that your minister is reminded to do something, seeing that the hotline that runs in this town has some more financial support so the kids have some place they can talk, the RAP centers, the crisis centers, that the doctors be sure that some of the hospitals have beds available. All these things you can do. And if just 10 of you, and all of you here, do something, out of the 10, one may save one child's life. That's all. And if that child, for instance, had have been my child, I would have crawled here from Hollywood on my knees. Thank you.